Did you know that since 1066, there have been 38 coronations in England? And quite frankly, none of them could possibly have been as extravagant and as crass and as barking mad as the coronation of King George IV in 1821. When I was researching this, it, it, quite frankly, it's like a box of blinking frogs. Absolutely mad. So let me tell you the story about what happened on the 19th of July, 1821. King George IV was the 57-year-old son of King George III, he who'd lost the colonies and also uh, was still on the throne at the battles of Trafalgar and the battles of Waterloo, and Queen Charlotte. And he'd come to the throne the previous year upon the death of his father. For the previous nine years, he'd actually acted as Prince Regent during his father's incapacity from mental illness, as portrayed in the film The Madness of King George. Okay. And he was renowned for his extravagance and the huge debts that he ran up. He's best remembered for his lavish funding of his pleasure dome, the Royal Pavilion in Brighton. In fact, it was his, it was his debts that led to his disastrous marriage. In an attempt to control his wayward son, his father arranged for a marriage to his cousin, Caroline of Brunswick, a German princess, in return for his debts being cancelled. Hardly sound romantic ideals. And indeed, rather than love at first sight, their marriage was one of absolute dislike at first sight. George took one look at his intended bride and openly ordered a brandy. She announced that he looked very fat. And things never really got any better. Caroline spent large parts of her marriage living in Germany and she definitely didn't live the life of a nun. If there was anything bigger than George's debt, it was his waistline. As I say, even, even when they met in the 1790s, Princess Caroline had commented on how fat he was. He was nicknamed the Prince of Pleasure. And by the time he ascended the throne in 1820, he weighed in on close on 24 stone. And even when he was wearing his girdle, aka a corset, on coronation day, his waist, okay, with a, with a corset on, measured 55 inches. So, with all that background information, you won't be surprised to know that no expense was spared by George IV for his coronation ceremony. Well, I say no public expense was spared because, as usual, uh, what George ordered and what he could pay for were two totally separate things. Uh, the government had to step in. Uh, it was the, the, the most talked about glitz coronation of region, recent times have been Napoleon's coronation as the Emperor of France in 1804. And there was no way that anyone as extravagant and as a showman as George was going to let Napoleon have pole position. The coronation ceremony cost over uh, 10 million pounds in today's money. In fact, the government had to dig into reparations they had received from France after Napoleon's uh, defeat to actually balance the books. This was money they could have spent on other things in Britain. They had to spend on the coronation ceremony. The coronation day on the 19th of July, 1821, split into three parts. Okay, there was the procession from Westminster Abbey to, sorry, the procession to Westminster Abbey from Westminster Hall. Secondly, there was the coronation service. And thirdly, there was the coronation banquet. Uh, peers, noble people, lords and ladies, started arriving at Westminster Hall from 1 a.m. in the morning. And by 6 a.m., the streets around West, the Palace of Westminster were so gridlocked there in London with carriages that the lords and ladies were having to get out and climb, uh, sorry, get out and walk all the way to the hall to get there for the 10 o'clock start. And there they were. At 10 o'clock, everyone was assembled, waiting and ready in, to, to process to Westminster Abbey. Everyone, that is, except the star of the show. George had spent the night at the home of the Speaker of the House of Commons, right there in Westminster Palace. So where the heck was he? Well, he was probably being shoehorned into that corset that I was telling you about earlier. But fear not, at 10.30, half an hour late, the doors flung open and entered King George IV, resplendent in a suit of silver cloth with gold lace and gold braid. He had a wig, a plumed hat that was studded with diamonds, and a 27-foot red velvet robe trailing behind him. And finally, at last, as the day warmed up, and everyone was in their lavish costumes, not least George, 
the procession to Westminster Abbey could begin. Unlike uh, Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953, the procession did not involve carriages and horses. It was more, I guess, more like a carnival pageant or a gigantic catwalk, which is quite appropriate for his glam king, George IV. The procession proceeded on a raised carpeted, uh, a raised sort of platform, which was carpeted, so the crowds could, could have a good view of them. Uh, and George might have been extravagant and, and obese, but he was, if nothing else, a showman. Uh, the procession start consisted, it consisted of 700 lords and ladies and other notables, and he got them all to dress up in sort of mock fake Tudor and Stuart costumes just for the show, many of which he personally had designed. It, uh, the, the, the procession started with a, a, a very pretty lady, she was almost like an actress, Miss Fellows. She was the herb woman and her six attendants at the front. It was an ancient tradition that they, they scattered flowers and herbs to ward off pestilence and disease in the, in the forthcoming reign. Then came the lords and ladies, followed by uh, various orders of chivalry, like the, the Knights of the Garter, uh, the Lord Mayor of London, then, then Prince Leopold. Prince Leopold was the widower of George's only daughter, Princess Charlotte, who had died four years previously. He, Leopold would later become the King of Belgium, and his nephew, Albert, would marry Queen Victoria. Uh, then came the heir presumptive, uh, the, uh, George's brother, because he didn't have any children now, because Charlotte had died, George's brother, the Duke of Clarence, who would indeed become William IV. And finally, the king himself, with that velvet robe having to be held by eight pages because of its weight. The procession entered Westminster Abbey through the west door, and the king entered to Handel's Hallelujah Chorus. I mean, you've got to give it to him. This was a man who, Hallelujah, and in he came. You know, it, uh, scaffolding had been erected in Westminster Abbey to accommodate more than 5,000 guests. Before the anointing with holy oil, another Ham Handel composition was sung, Zadok the Priest. Uh, it, it uses the words from the Old Testament when the priest in the Old Testament, Zadok, actually appoint, uh, anointed King Solomon. And Handel's composition of Zadok the Priest has been played at every coronation since George IV's great-grandfather, actually, George II, in 1727, last played in 1953 at Queen Elizabeth's uh, coronation. For the football fans, the soccer fans amongst you, football fans, uh, it's also the theme tune to the Champions League. <laughs> the words in Zadok the Priest, although not the song, have actually been used in every coronation ceremony since King Edgar was crowned King of the English at Bath Abbey in 973. Amazing traditions we have in England with the English coronation ceremonies, obviously British coronation ceremonies now. And the service went on and on and on for five hours. The 57 year old obese king had to sit in his velvet costume with his wig and his hat, which by now had been replaced by St. Edward's crown, which itself weighs five pounds on his head. And the summer's day got hotter and the abbey got hotter. Poor old George used 19 handkerchiefs during the coronation service to wipe the sweat off his face. And now the Archbishop of York was delivering a sermon. When would this ever, ever end? It was now that one of the most farcical and embarrassing moments at an English or British coronation ceremony happened, okay? Estranged wife, Caroline, rocked up to be crowned queen. Now, George was absolutely adamant there was no way she was going to be crowned on his big day, or indeed ever, if he had his way. In fact, she hadn't even been invited to the ceremony. She didn't have a ticket to come to the coronation ceremony of her husband. <laughs> Nevertheless, there she was getting out of her carriage and advancing on the door with a, a, a noble supporter of hers. And uh, this is where the fun really starts. George IV had hired 18 professional uh, boxers, bare knuckle fighters, to act as effectively bouncers on his big day. And they were dressed in fake Tudor Stuart costume. But unlike the king, you know, they looked extremely fit and menacing. Um, imagine, yeah, 18 boxers, Tyson Fury, uh, dressed in a mock, mock Tudor costume. Uh, it, it, uh, the mind boggles, doesn't it? At, at a royal coronation. And they, they, in fact, they blocked her entry. So she raced off to a side door and was met by more boxers. And then another door 
and more boxers. And meanwhile, this is all in front of the crowds who are watching this incredible farcical spectacle. And finally, totally humiliated, Caroline had to get back in her carriage and head back to her house. And meanwhile, inside the Abbey, with a rousing rendition of God Save the King, it was all over. And it was time to have some fun and party. And George and all, all, the, the, and all of the, the, the nobles retraced their steps in a procession back to Westminster Hall for the coronation banquet. And this is where we have the next farcical moment of the proceedings. The elderly barons of the sink ports were charged with holding a canopy on poles above the king. In fact, they'd done this ever since the coronation of Richard I, over 600 years previously. The problem was, for a showman like George, the canopy not only protected him from the summer sun, but prevented him from being seen by all the spectators. And this just would not do for George. So he managed to move his rather large frame ahead of the canopy so that they could, he could be adored by as many of the well-wishers as possible. Well, the poor old barons of the sink port, however, they only had one job, hold a canopy over the king. And they've been doing it for 600 years. And now what they saw was the king, they were visible, king ahead of them, not under the canopy. They were, very, they were visibly failing to do their job. So they sped up and covered the king, who sped up to get ahead of them. So they sped up, and so in some sort of, you know, like Benny Hill comedy routine, we had this obese, sweating king being chased by some elderly men dressed in fake Tudor and Stuart costumes, carrying a large canopy towards Westminster Hall. There's been a, a coronation banquet, funny enough, ever since Richard the Lionheart's coronation in 1194. But in true George IV style, this was the biggest and the best. And it was also actually to be the last. Over 1,200 guests were seated at 47 tables. Uh, another 2,900 guests were um, watched the proceedings from a raised gallery around the hall. The hall was lit by, by 28 giant chandeliers uh, involving 2,000 candles. And the whole event was overseen by three nobles on horseback riding up and down in the middle of Westminster Hall, including the Duke of Wellington, uh, Victor of, of uh, Waterloo in his role as uh, Lord High Constable of England. Wine was flowing, the lords and ladies were rehydrating from that mammoth coronation service on wine. Spirits were raised, everyone was having fun. Lucky for George that he had his hired bouncers were still there to keep order because things were getting leery. Those uh, 18 professional boxers in fake Tudor costumes included uh, John Gentleman Jackson, the former champion of England, who now run a, ran a boxing school. And he counted amongst uh, his, and counted uh, the poet Lord Byron amongst his protégés, taught him to box. Alongside him was uh, a chap called Bill Richmond, a former slave from America, uh, a black guy. He was, his story is actually an amazing story, one to be told separately to this, really. He, he came to England and married a white woman, and he only turned to bare knuckle bo boxing, fighting in his 40s to support his family. With 17 wins from 19 fights, he became a, a celebrity and he mixed with the nobility and with MPs. And now here he was in this sort of semi-official capacity at the coronation of the King of Britain. Bill Richmond was probably the very first black sports superstar in Britain. And I think, yeah, maybe it's one I'll talk about. He'll, I'll talk about his story again in the future. Anyway, the food was served, and by tradition, one of the knighted, uh, mounted noblemen, the Lord High Steward, would dismount from his horse, approach the king's table, and with a flourish, unveil the first dish for the king. This particular uh, Lord High Steward was a man called the, the Marquis of Anglesey, and he had actually lost a leg at the Battle of Waterloo, and so he now rode on a horse with a, a prosthetic leg. Unfortunately, he could not get out of his prosthetic leg which the, while he, trying to get off the horse to go and do his, his hereditary job, and the, the assembled guests absolutely howled with laughter. Uh, poor old Marquis of Anglesey, how humiliating. Uh, he did get off his horse and do it, but I mean, nevertheless. Also, for the very fast, last time, I said this was the last time we had a coronation banquet, also for the very last time in British history, the hereditary king's champion now went to the hall on horseback, fully suited in armour, throwback to medieval times, and he threw his gauntlet down three times. He challenged everyone who denied the king's right to wear the crown of England. There were no takers, lucky for him, because the hereditary king's champion was actually 20-year-old Henry Dimmock, uh, the son of a priest, 
who was so non-martial he didn't even own a horse. They, the fine steed used by the King's Champion to enter Westminster Hall on the coronation banquet had actually been borrowed from a circus. <laughs> it, gets, it gets better and better, doesn't it? By now the banquet was coming to an end, and just as well, because the ladies were starting to faint from the heat, lords were passing out on the floor. I mean, people were so pissed, they were passing out at a coronation banquet. Ah! <laughs> and the guests were experiencing a sudden downpour of melted wax all over their lovely costumes from the, from the, melted, ca from the melting candles. Um, with another rendition of God Save the King, George IV and his guests left, and the last coronation banquet ever held in Britain was over. It was at this moment that the spectators were now allowed to descend and help themselves to the remains of the food and the wine and the cutlery and the crockery and then they moved on to the kitchens and they were only prevented from looting them by the hasty arrival of armed soldiers. I mean this is, the, this is a party, have you ever been to a party like this? Elsewhere, the, the, celebra the celebrations might have been raucous, but at least tro troops weren't needed, nor was Bill Richmond and his fellow boxers. I in Hyde Park, the Serpentine Lake was aglow with, with lanterns that night, and the crowds were treated to a firework display. Uh, that evening's performances of all the London's theatres were free of charge. The cost paid by King George himself. Well, the government on King George's behalf. Hey? In Brighton, Home to George's most extravagant showpiece, the Royal Pavilion, uh, there was one, there was a there was a an ox roast for eight thousand of the townspeople. And meanwhile, a party was held up in Manchester, where only two years before mounted troops had killed eighteen people protesting for greater freedoms. This crowd now cheered loudly for the cheered loudly for the king, and until the free beer ran out. And then they started cheering for Queen Caroline. Oh, oh, fickle people. Hey? Oh, and what about Queen Caroline? How did she spend the rest of Coronation Day? Well, she went back to her house and wrote to George demanding her own coronation for the following Monday. True to form, George ignored her. And on the 7th of August, 19 days after her humiliating ex exclusion from the coronation at Westminster Abbey, Caroline died. George IV lived for another nine years, and upon his death he was succeeded, as I said earlier, by his brother William IV. And in 1837, when William died, the young daughter of another deceased brother came to the throne. And her name was Victoria. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. British tradition meets British comedy. I mean, this is like Kardashians meets a Whitehall farce or something. It's, it's brutal, isn't it? The coronation of King George IV, 19th of July, 1821, will probably never, ever be beaten. <laughs> See you soon. If you haven't already, subscribe to my channel on YouTube, or why don't you sign up uh, to hear more of these talks at thehistorychat.com. Take care.